today again in the name of Jesus the Christ, the resurrected Lord who offers us grace and peace. Multiplied thanks to our worship team, praise team, who, uh, who are so dedicated and do such great work. Um, worship leaders always have us prepared. Our band leaders always have, uh, have the band in ship shape. I deeply appreciate that. More, more than you know, I, de I deeply appreciate um, their work. And so many of you are, are carrying loads for Jesus in and through his church, and I, I want to say thank you for that as well. It's good to see each and every one of you today. If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to open to Matthew chapter 11. Maybe it doesn't look like um, the Christmas story yet. We pick that up in earnest next week um, from Matthew chapter 1. But Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 11 is our, our primary text for today. I'm um, going to deal with John the Baptist a little bit more. We did last week. Today's the final week we look at John the Baptist and his, his ministry. Um, looking forward to that. Let's break the bread of life together, shall we? If you're able to stand as we read the Lord's Word, uh, we invite you to do that. If you need to remain seated, totally understand. My, my knees are not what they used to be, I'm here to say. Matthew 11, verse 2. John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all the things the Messiah was doing, so he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you, are you the Messiah we've been expecting? Or should we keep looking for someone else? Jesus told them, Go back to John and tell him what you have heard and seen. The blind see. The lame walk. Those with leprosy are cured. The deaf hear. The dead are raised to life. And the good news is being preached to the poor. And he added, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began talking to him or talking about him to the crowds. What kind of man did you all see when you went out into the wilderness? Or did you go to sea when you went out into the wilderness? Was he a weak reed, swayed by every breath of wind? Or were you expecting to see a man dressed in expensive clothes? No, with expensive, or, no people with expensive clothes live in palaces. Were you looking for a prophet? Yes, and he is more than a prophet. John is the man to whom the scriptures refer when they say, Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. And he will prepare your way before you. He will prepare your way before you. Verse 11. I tell you the truth. Of all who ever have lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. Yet even the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. The word of the Lord for God's people. Thanks be to God. You may be seated this morning. I kind of have built up in my mind um, what I think my best day would be. Maybe you have one of those idyllic, um, ideal setups in your brain as to what you think um, your best day might be like. I will give you some things that I and people that I think would be included in my best day. My best day would include Jesus. These are in particular order, by the way. My best day includes Jesus, Ashley, each of my five kids. I still shake my head every now and then and think, we really had five kids. That was a crazy, Bruce, that was a crazy thing to do and beautiful. That's right. <laughs> but also, if possible, extended family outside of my kids. My best day would include my church family. My, des my best day, even though I'm wearing taco socks today, my, my best day includes pizza. I don't care what you say. My best day includes pizza. Barbecue's good. I'm looking forward to that. Um, but my best day includes pizza and music and exercise all in that order. That would be included in my best day. 
Maybe you haven't had time to think about that. I won't ask you for a quiz or for a test. Um, but we're here to talk about some of the days of John the Baptist. And by the way, the passage that we just read, I'm proposing, was not John's best day. I'll categorize that in a moment as his worst day, but I guess I just did that right then. John's best day, I believe we talked about last Sunday. John's best day is found in Matthew chapter 3. My surmise, maybe he found a better day, maybe he experienced a better day, but there couldn't have been many better than the days we read about back in chapter 3. He goes out into the wilderness and people hand over fist are piling out of Jerusalem and Judea and they come out to the wilderness to hear him preach. They hear the word of the Lord from John. They are moved in their heart. They are moved to the point that they're willing to change, to be baptized, to live holy lives, um, to follow God the best way they know how. I think that must have been one of John's best days. Hundreds, if not thousands of people's lives were changed for the better because of what John was doing that day. I would, I would also like to particularly note that John the Baptist's best day was intricately woven into the fabric and the pattern of Jesus. If you remember from the sermon last week that John, not my sermon, but John's sermon, that John said, one is coming after me whose sandals I'm not even willing, I'm not even able, um, and I'm not good enough to step down and, and tie or untie his shoes or his sandals. So John's best day was intricately woven into the life of Jesus. John the Baptist could not see, and John the Baptist would not have seen his best day apart from Jesus. And I would say, neither can we. We cannot imagine any of our lives. Those who've, who've come to trust in Jesus, place our lives in his hands, um, hear his voice every day through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's hard to imagine if you've been serving Jesus any length of time, whether it's a day or 70 years, it's hard to imagine the blessings of this life apart from the hands of Jesus all over you. Amen? Amen. That is true because this is also true. I'm being exclusive. I recognize I'm being exclusive because it's right and it's true, not because I'm trying to exclude anyone in the process of saying this. As in a moment of pastoral privilege, I would say that no one, no single human being can know the height of human existence. No one can have his or her best day. No one can appreciate the pinnacle of the human experience apart from Jesus Christ. No one can. That is not to say other people can't find happiness other ways. I believe that it's possible. But no one can experience the kind of life that Jesus talked about. He used the word zoe for life. If you go back, back to John chapter 3. No one had ever used that Greek word the way Jesus used it. And he was saying there is one possible way to experience the highest possible blessedness of a, of, of a person, of a creature. And that is life lived for and experienced in the presence of Jesus Christ. John's best day was when he was preaching about the one who would come after him and the fact that, that they would be baptized with the power of the Spirit because of what Jesus did. John could baptize with water, but only Jesus would, able, would be able to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So my encouragement, my exhortation and my admonition to you, as you may spend some time today or tomorrow thinking about your possible best day, would be this. Don't forget to build it entirely around, first and foremost, Jesus the Christ. 
Most of us have experienced hard times. The older we are, probably the more opportunities we've had to go through difficult days. I had a, had a conversation with a, a lady who was a part of our church in Florida um, just yesterday morning. Um, they lost, they're, they're in their 80s, Bill and Barbara in their 80s, they lost their second son in as many years just yesterday morning. Knew it was coming, but it, it, it was hard for me to offer words of condolences um, that make sense at a moment like that and, and in experiencing a loss like they're losing. And she had some questions back for me that I couldn't answer. <laughs> um, only God can answer and, and will answer those questions. Maybe you've had a few of what we're talking about here concerning worst days. John had a worst day, and I think it's this text that we read a few moments ago. John was in jail. Herod Antipas was one of the sons of Herod the Great. Go, we'll talk about Herod the Great a little bit next Sunday. He was, um, he was, he was the king of all, of all of that region, the king of Judea. He was not Jewish, but he really wanted to be. And he, was, he was a pretty good leader. He was a ruthless man, but he had at least four sons with multiple different women. And among the sons um, who, who um, became leaders of the region at Herod's death was this guy, Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas had, had stolen his half-brother's wife. Her name was Herodias, interestingly enough. He had stolen his half-brother's, um, his half-brother's wife and had taken her as his wife. And John, the prophet of God, who was known and popular and well-known, um, spoke out publicly against Herod, taking Herodias as his wife. Well, Herod Antipas kind of liked John. He was irritated by John. He didn't like the fact that John was preaching against the relationship that he was in. But at the same time, he was kind of mesmerized by him. He was uh, like Jesus talks about people born of the spirit. You don't know where they come from and you don't know what their angle is, but there's something magically and magnetically mysterious about him. That's what that's kind of how Herod felt about John the Baptist. So John, uh, John is preaching against Herod and Herodias. And because of that, Herod puts John in jail. It would have been a dungeon. It would have been prison-like. Herodias is trying to kill John. She'll ultimately get her way. Um, she's, she's able to, to do the things, influence Herod to get him, um, to get him executed. But that's, this is before that. John's experiencing discouragement. Needless to say, I think, I think the words that we read here today represent the fact that that John was experiencing doubt. It doesn't mean he didn't believe, but John was experiencing real doubts. He knew Jesus as a relative. He knew and believed in Jesus as the Messiah, the one who was to come. He really knew and believed that, and in spite of all of that, John was in the, uh, among the lowest positions of his life. He was experiencing real doubt, and he was asking real questions of Jesus in the middle of of his doubt. I want to say this. God is never offended when we ask him genuine questions in the middle of our doubt. God is not offended by that. The lady with whom I had a conversation yesterday, she was asking genuine questions. I just don't understand how. And I said back, I don't either. I don't understand how two loving, beloved disciples loved and followed Jesus their whole life, loved and followed Jesus in the same church of the Nazarene their whole lives, lose two sons in two years. I don't, I don't get that. I, I, it doesn't make sense. Her asking those questions in the middle of her doubt, genuine questions are okay. It doesn't mean you are outside the faith if you have a doubt or two that you genuinely bring before the feet of Jesus, he can handle it. He can handle it. Just look at the Psalms. There's plenty of, there's plenty of the Psalms that you read where the psalmist will say, what, pray what appears to be outlandish things. Oh God, how could you do this? How could you leave me alone? How could, I, how could you depart from me when I needed you the most? Those kinds of genuine doubts 
only God can take care of. John is experiencing some kind of doubt right here. He was asking questions like, Jesus, are you even the Christ? Are you even the Messiah? Are you the one? Um, and if you're not the one, have I, spent, have I misspent my entire life? John's asking those big kinds of questions in the, in the darkness of the dungeon where he's being held. And he had to know the answer. This, I think, represents among John the Baptist's worst days. But I want to point out something in particular. John's just asked about Jesus some, some pretty deprecating questions, some really questions that make, make Jesus not look to be in a very positive light, right? Are you even the Messiah? I've seen your miracles. I've heard and seen and experienced all those things, and I'm still not sure. And notice what Jesus says about him. And let me translate a little bit, if you'll, if you'll permit me. Down in verse 7, Jesus says about John, What kind of man did you go out into the wilderness to see? Was he a weak reed? Was he some vacillating doubter who doesn't know what he's talking about, swayed by every breath of wind? Were you expecting to see a man who was rich and wealthy and dressed in fine clothes? No. no look, at what, look what Jesus says about him at the end. All who have ever lived, of any human being who's ever lived, Nobody's greater than John the Baptist. And this is John on his worst day. That's what Jesus thinks about you on your worst day. In the middle of your deepest and darkest doubts, Jesus is in the business of picking you up and wrapping you in his arms and saying, it's going to be okay. We're going to make it through this together. Doubt is one part of faith. Ask the questions. Work through it. Jesus will hold you close and get you to the other side on your worst day. It is true. I promise you. He is true. He is the Messiah. He is the one who is from the first and the last. He is the one who is the author. Victor told us this morning. He is the one who is the author and perfecter of our faith. He is all the things he says he is and more. I also want to remind all of us today about our next day. I wish, I, I wish, there, were a, I wish there were a scriptural story. I, I'm kind of hoping that in, in The Chosen that they're going to work out some backstory that would be, you know, a, a figment of imagination. But I hope they do a backstory um, about John the Baptist in The Chosen after Jesus tells John this, John's disciples that John's the best, you know, best thing since sliced bread, even though sliced bread wasn't invented yet. John's the best. And, and they go back. I hope they show John's face when his disciples come back and say, Jesus still loves you, man. It's going to be okay. Jesus still loves you. Because that would have been John's next day. When he was at his lowest point, John, his disciples must have come back with tears streaming down their faces saying, John, he is, he really is, and it's going to be okay. He's upholding you. He's encouraging you. He's not, he's not abandoning you in any way, shape, or form. Go back and tell them what you have seen. I am the Messiah because the blind see and the lame walk and those with leprosy are cured and the deaf hear and the dead are raised to life and good news is being preached to the, preached to the poor. And if you believe that, and if you believe Jesus is who he says he is, then you will not fall away on account of him. And then, ultimately, finally, John's disciples on John's next day would have told him, Jesus thinks you're the greatest still. Jesus appreciates the life you've lived for him and the sermons you've preached for him. Jesus appreciates the way you have served him when it was difficult. Jesus appreciates the fact that you got out. If you're here, some of you are at home in Facebook, on Facebook, I appreciate your being there. But those of you who are in person today, Jesus appreciates the fact that you braved the weather, you came out in cold, rainy weather, and you came to worship anyway. Jesus appreciates what you have done for him. Hear me, those who seek Jesus out on their worst days are the ones who make it 
to see Jesus on their next day. And the next days, following the worst days, are not always guaranteed to be better. I'm not telling you that just because today is bad, that tomorrow is going to automatically better, be better. That, that might not necessarily be true. But I do want to tell you that so very often, our next days turn into our best days. Most of the documents that I produce for some kind of meeting or some kind of, some kind of public use here at the church, I put, this, I put these words at the bottom. You can't see them. Um, you can't read them. You might be able to see the words, but I put them on there because I believe them to be true. It says, our best days are just ahead. So if you could read that, Alex, you don't have to zero in on that. But if you could read that, that's what it says. It's, this is today's order of service. I believe that our best days are just ahead. I believe that persevering and prevailing through our worst days will lead us to our next days. And it just might be true that our next day becomes our best day. If you're going through your worst day today, hold on. Hold on to Jesus. Grab a hold of the hem of his garment if you can't reach his hand. Grab a hold of one single solitary verse of scripture that you can memorize and rehearse and remember and go through time after time in the middle of your worst day until your worst day becomes your next day and your next day becomes your best day. It, will, it could become your best day because Jesus will not leave you. He will not give up on you. He will not forsake you. He's the one who prayed as he was bleeding from the cross and about to breathe his final breath. Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. That is to say that because Jesus died on the cross, that your life has infinite meaning. Not because you're all that, but because Jesus believes you are all that. And because that's true, it's true. Amen and amen. We're on the home stretch. I've done three out of, we're through three out of four points. If you want to breathe a sigh of relief, you can do that. You've been listening real good. Thank you for that. And then we read about, if you were to turn over a couple of pages in the scriptures, you don't have to, but if you were to turn over to chapter 14 of the book of Matthew, Verses 1 through 12, you would be able to also read about John the Baptist's last day. John did have a last day on the face of the earth. So Herod Antipas is throwing this big party, and all kinds of important and famous dignitaries are in attendance at that party, not to mention his kind of wife, kind of mistress, kind of sister-in-law, kind of half-sister, most of Herod's family was intermarried, and it was really, if you look at his, you can look it up online today, and they're, most of them are pretty accurate. Herod the Great had a really tangled family tree. Like he was from, uh, I won't say that, I've just censored myself. He had a really tangled family tree, and not only was Herod there, but Herodias was there, and Herodias' daughter, Salome, um, was also there. And so the, at this big party, Salome stands up and, and does this dance. It would not have been an appropriate dance. I'm not going to describe it any further than that, but it would have been something like that. It would have been one of those dances that you would have wanted to move forward if you were on TikTok or if you were on Facebook and something like that came up. You'd want to scroll through and click unfollow if you could. That was the kind of dance that Salome did. But the, the dance so pleased the guests and it so pleased Herod Antipas that he opened his big mouth and he said something like, he was kind of, he was kind of saying in, in jest, he was, he was so pleased with Salome's dance, he said, okay, you ask me for anything up to half my kingdom and I'll give it to you. So it was kind of a, it was kind of a party joke, um, but he said the words out loud. Romans were known for wanting to be um, he was under the auspices of Rome. Romans were known for wanting to be truthful. So he speaks these words, and then Salome goes to her mom, Herodias, and Herodias says, okay, we got him. Herodias wanted John dead, and so she said, okay, request for the head of John the platter. 
uh, John the Baptist on a platter. She does. Herod had to keep his promise in front of his party guests or he would have looked foolish. And so John was offered up in death. And it would appear from a human standpoint that John's life ends in a tragedy. But from an eternal point of view, and that's where we look at this, John the Baptist remained faithful to and preached the truth of God in Jesus Christ right up to the very, very end of his life. Let me tell you, those who stay true to Jesus till the end, whether your end is today or tomorrow or a hundred years from now, those who stay true to Jesus win, period. If you stay true to Jesus and you are a success, I came across this definition of success some years ago. I wrote it down. I didn't wrote, write down who said it. I put it on a post-it note, and I don't have the post-it note anymore. I've since thrown it away, but I saved it on my computer. And this defini definition of success I think is very accurate. It says, success is, first and foremost, doing what God has asked us to do according to his will and in his timing. Success is, first and foremost, doing what God has asked us to do according to his will and in his timing. On John's last day, even though he was beheaded in a horrible kind of way, he was an absolute success. He stayed true to Jesus to the end. And that's the point, the point and the goal of this life and what will be rewarded in the next life is serving the Lord and loving the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving our neighbors the way we love ourselves. That's the point of this life. That's the goal of this life. That's the reward we'll receive in the next one for having successfully made it through that one. And if you will, though you might wonder, why isn't the preacher preaching about the birth of Jesus? I will next week. I'll be preaching about the birth of Jesus. But the point of, ad, the, point of the Advent season is to get us prepared, is for me to help you get prepared for your last day. Nothing else matters. And what if it did? To make sure that when you leave this world and you leave this life, you are prepared to meet Jesus and to fall prostrate at his feet and sing, praise God from whom all blessings flow, and to hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Ain't nothing else as important as that. That's why we're here on a cold, rainy day in the place where it's never supposed to rain, so says the song. That's why we're here, to make, to make sure we're prepared to meet him on our last day. That's the point of Advent. Only God is our creator. Only God has sent to us a Savior at the first Advent, the first coming and the first arrival of Jesus. Only God will be, we talked about this in Sunday school a little bit if you were in our class, only God will be our re-creator. When Jesus shows up, we will see him and he will make us to be supremely like he is. We will have a, a glorified body, a glorified spirit, and a glorified nature on that last great day getting up morning. He's our recreator as well as our creator. But the point of this message is to say this. Only God is our arbitrator. Only God will be the one who judges us for the life that we lived, the words that we spoke, the way that we loved, the way that we didn't love, my responsibility for all of God's flock here at the bridge is to ask, are you ready to meet him on your last day?
It's a rhetorical question, but it's not. It's a question that every saint and every sinner alike has to look way down deep inside and say, with a humble heart and a humble spirit, Jesus, are you pleased with my life? How I'm living it, the words that I'm saying, the attitudes that I'm, that I'm making habitual in my life, are you pleased with all of those things? By the way, I am not exempted from any of these questions. All the questions I send out are boomerang and they come right back to me as well. So whether this is your best day or your worst day or your next day or your last day, two final pieces of wisdom I want to leave with you. Whichever one of those days happens to be the one that you're in, I want to invite you once again to make Jesus the center of the day that you're in right now. Make Jesus first. Put Jesus first and foremost. This is the Sunday of joy in Advent. I believe with all of my heart when we put Jesus first and we put his word and his law and his love and all of those things, his death, burial, resurrection, we put all of those things before us. Whichever of the four days we're in are days of joy. Even for those who've gone through the worst day because Jesus is in this day, you can know and experience his presence, Garrett, and you can know and experience his joy. I'm a school teacher, man. I see faces and I call names. You can know and experience his joy right now in the middle of this day. Shall we pray? Mm-hmm.